Hi everyone, I'm Mathieu. Welcome to this uh, JumpDev uh, workshop 2022 together with Julicon. What brings me here today is I want to give you a user's perspective on using Jump in a relatively large academic project. So I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, US, and I'm part of the Ramsey project, which is which stands for Risk Aware Market Clearing. And so what I want to tell you about today is first who we are, what we do in that project, and then how we came to using Jump and how it fits in our workflow and what we do. So let's start about with, with the project itself and what we're trying to do. So RAMSY stands for Risk Aware Market Clearing. It's an academic project funded by RPE. It's a government agency in the US. We're about two years into our three-year term for, for this project. It's a collaboration between two universities, Georgia Tech and Vanderbilt as well as an, an industrial partner, MISO, who handles the electricity grid in the US. What we're trying to do is to bridge optimization, machine learning, and risk analysis. And more specifically, we're trying to develop new algorithms for risk-aware market clearing, specifically for electricity markets, and to evaluate the benefits of such algorithms on US power systems. For a broad overview of the Ramsey project, I'll uh, direct you to this paper that is available on archive, and I'll focus on a broad overview here so that I can really talk about where Jump fits within the project as a whole. There will be no math, there will be no talk about power systems in, in the discussion today. So what we try to do in Ramsey rests upon four methodological pillars. The first one is probabilistic forecasting. Second one is optimization and certainty. Then we have risk quantification and management. And finally, putting machine learning into everything to accelerate all these different tools. So what you're seeing here is really an interplay between machine learning, optimization, and then risk analysis, which means everything that we do is really tightly integrated, not just on the methodological and mathematical level, but also when we code and develop tools. That's going to be a big motivation for the choices we made and how we integrated our code within that particular project. So who we are, we are about 20 people spread across two universities, part at Georgia Tech, part at Vanderbilt University. We have several professors, several pro postdocs in the team, as well as about 15 students, including both PhD students and undergraduate students. Our expertise is varied. We have people who know about optimization, people who know about machine learning, power systems, statistics, risk and reliability analysis. And this wide area of expertise is also reflected in the programming languages that we like to use in our research. So for instance, optimization people in our group like to use Julia, machine learning people like to use Python, statisticians like to use R, and our colleagues at Vanderbilt University, they like to use MATLAB. So of course, if you were taking a different team in a different setting, you might have a different set of programming language, but for us, this is what everybody prefer to be working with. When you look at things from a very coding perspective, a few things are interesting to say. The first one is that there was only one person in the group who was actually the principal investigator who had experience writing industry grade software. If you look at the rest of the team, actually most people don't even have a CS background. And those who do have a CS background may not have a software engineering background. Most people have never used Git. They've never worked in a large team on a large code base. And very few people have the habit of writing unit tests or documentation. Now, I'm not saying this to criticize anybody in the team, of course. I think we have a, a very typical set of, of competencies and know-hows that you might find in, in a different academic project. But I do want to emphasize that the human factor is extremely important in the way that we've organized a project in the way that we've decided on the tools that we, that we were going to use. What that means is that, again, for a different team with a different set of expertise, we would have probably made different decisions. So what I'm going to try to do is really focus on what questions did we ask ourselves when making decisions? What made us choose option A over option B rather than the final decision, which, again, would depend on the context. So today's questions are going to be threefold. The first one is going to be, how did we end up using Jump in the project? And then the 
Two others are going to be more focused on how we use it. What do we use Jump for? What do we like about Jump? What do we not like about Jump in terms of feature, in terms of performance, et cetera? So let me start with the first one. How did we end up using Jump? In other words, why do you use Jump instead of another tool? Well, when we started the project, so this was September 2020, I was interviewing with Pascal Van Hentenrich, who's the head of the project, in, for the postdoc position to join the group. And so we talked about programming languages, we talked about software libraries, and we identified a set of needs that we had for the project. So we knew we were going to do machine learning that was going to be in Python, but the optimization part, it was still open whether this was going to be in C++, Julia, or Python. So here are the main things that we needed. We knew that we needed something that was going to allow us to do a lot of data manipulation, data processing, to do that efficiently and conveniently. On the optimization side, we needed something that would allow us to do linear programming, mixed integer linear programming, and then mixed integer nonlinear programming. And we knew that when doing that, we were gonna have to use callbacks for some parts of it. We wanted to have a tool that could support multiple solvers so that we could switch without having to rewrite the whole code base and something that was cross-platform. Any tool that did not satisfy all of those needs would be disqualified for us to be using within the project. And then we had features that we wanted to have, but again, if we didn't have those, we could have still been able to carry out the project. I think the most important one of the features we wanted was the ability to reach for support and to find resources whenever we would get into trouble. We also wanted something that was easy to install, that had a fast learning curve. Remember, we have a lot of people in the group who did not have a very strong software engineering background. We wanted something that had reasonable performance, although we'll see that performance is not the largest issue that, that we de dealt with. And finally, we wanted something that could interface with Python so that we could use this together with machine learning. We are, I'm also gonna talk about a few other functionalities that we wanted to have. I'll talk about that more later in the presentation. So what tools could we have used if not Jump? Well, we could have written our code in C++ and use either Gravity or OR tools. The only issue with OR tools being that it does not support nonlinear programming. If we had chosen Julia, we would have chosen Jump. And if we had chosen Python, then Pyomo would be the most popular choice for a modeling layer in Python. So what made the difference? What was the main criterion that we chose? Well, first of all, we eliminated C++ because very few people in the team knew C++ as well as a new Julia or Python. So that got eliminated. Now it just happened that the new postdoc, AKA me, knew a lot about Julia, knew a lot about Jump, and I knew exactly who I would be able to ask and where if I ever needed help. I also knew that if I ever run into a small trouble, uh, a small bug, something that I uh, knew how to fix, then I could fix it on my own, submit a pull request and, and have that, um, included in this release. The final thing in terms of having something that was easy to use, easy to install, is that if we were going with Julia, that would factor away all the difficulty of compiling external sol solvers, such as IPOPT, CBC, as I don't know, highs, which might be surprising to some, but I myself wouldn't know how to do that right away. Um, so being in Julia, essentially limit, would eliminate that complexity, which would allow us to spend energy on other parts of the project. So altogether, I think those three criteria that really reflect the expertise of the team uh, and the people who were gonna be involved in the project made us go for jump as the best compromise between the features that we wanted. So having said that, what do we use jump for in the project? And then what do we like or not about jump? So I'm gonna talk now about how Drum fits within our workflow and what we use it for and how. So to give you a little bit of additional background, the optimization problems that we deal with in Ramsey are, are of various kinds. So we're dealing with linear, mixed integer linear, nonlinear programming problems that are fairly common in power systems. The main difference being we're using formulations based on what our industrial partner is using. So they may differ a little bit from academic formulations that you might see in, in typical papers. The problems that we deal with, they have hundreds of thousands to millions of variables and constraints. 
they typically have millions to tens of millions of non-zeros and coefficients. These are just too big to inspect by hand if we ever need to do some debug, which means if we get into that situation, we have to be able to do that programmatically. And finally, if we look at timings, it typically takes us a fraction of a second to a few dozens of seconds to build those optimization problems. And then anywhere between, again, a fraction of a second to about an hour to solve them. Really the important thing here is that building, the time it takes to build a problem is relatively small in comparison to the time it takes to solve the problem. And that's gonna come up afterwards when we talk about performance. So our typical optimization workflow is something that you would very likely see in any other project that involves optimization. We have data inputs, we build a model, we solve it, and that solution phase might involve us coding some optimization algorithm ourselves, uh, and then exporting the results. And then post-processing the results, doing some analysis, et cetera, et cetera. So in the best of ideal worlds, all of this works fine. There's no bug, everything runs smoothly. You can do all the analysis that you want, but in real life we have bugs. And so the big question here is what if something goes wrong in this pipeline? What if we have a model that was supposed to be feasible, but is actually infeasible? What if we have results that make no physical sense whatsoever? Well, then we know something is wrong and we have to go back to the code and we have to find where we have an error, we have to fix it and we wanna do that as fast as possible. So we want to come up with way, ways of dealing with those sources of errors as smoothly and systematically as possible. So let me give you a brief overview of the common sources of errors that, that we've encountered. So we have errors from data inputs. Maybe we're reading the wrong file or we're making a mistake when we're pre-processing the data. Maybe we have issues in the mathematical formulation. That's just the math is not correct. There's no bug in the code, everything runs smoothly. You have an input, you have an output. Uh, but again, the, the numerical result is incorrect because of invalid mathematical terms in the optimization problem. Maybe we have issues when doing post-processing and this can be as simple as the person who took those numbers and made a table in a report, made a mistake when copying the numbers or when, when summing them, et cetera. And there can be any kind of other issues from having the wrong version of a package to having a bug in an external dependency. Any and all of these have actually happened to us at least once. So these are not completely irrealistic things. They can happen when we have a, a, a large team with lots of people and mistakes are just gonna happen. So what we wanna do is being able to detect such mistakes as early as possible and solve them as fast as possible. So how do we handle those errors? How do we debug a mathematical model where not just the code may not throw an exception, but we have to find out what is the issue mathematically. So we have different ways of doing that. Two of them are based on writing systematically unit tests and then comparing the outputs of our problem to a reference solution that's been computed from a different method. So these are what I would say are preventive actions. You put them in your code base in order to detect mistakes as early as possible. Now, of course, you're only gonna catch what you're testing for. Uh, so this is something that is very efficient when you have a simple workflow. So something like data processing uh, is very useful if you have small test cases that you can run systematically uh, and fast. And so this is something that you want to have in your code base, but it's not going to catch everything. There are still cases and days where you're going to run into issues. And one very typical issue for us was running into problems that were um, found to be infeasible by the solver, which for us was never supposed to happen. So how do we do in that case where we have to find whether the issue is about the data or the issue is about the model? Um, and so a tool that we found extremely useful for doing that is called conflict analysis. It's also known as finding an irreducible inconsistent subsystem. So the idea here is to identify the constraints that are causing the infeasibility in the problem and only have a very small subset of constraints that together is enough to cause infeasibility. Now, this is a functionality that is available in all the main MIP solvers like Ruby or Cplex. It's actually one of the features that Jump is the only modeling tool that I know of that actually exports and exposes at the modeling level. So specifically in Jump, you can use that with this compute 
compute conflict function. And so doing that and then looking at the constraints that, are, uh, that appear in this conflict and finding out where the, the cause of the issue is, is literally our go-to approach for anything that is unexpectedly infeasible and then similarly for anything that is unexpectedly unbounded. So being able to really programmatically identify the source of the problem, printing out the constraints, looking at the terms and saying, okay, is this the correct mathematical expression? Do we have the right variables? Do we have the right constraints? And then looking at the data in those mathematical terms, do we have the right numbers? If yes, then what is causing the problem? If not, where did the problem arise? This has allowed us to be extremely efficient where finding out the cause of errors and then fixing it afterwards. And I, I can say that right now, if there's any issue like this that occurs, we can typically find the issue and fix it in a matter of one to two days. Uh, so this has allowed us to streamline these, these bug fixes and issuing fixes very, very fast so that we can move forward in the rest of the project. That being said, uh, there are a few things that we would like uh, to improve uh, in, within the gem code. However, I do want to start with what we don't need to improve because there's actually a lot of things that we can already do in jump even though it's not directly exposed in jump. Now in particular, whenever you work with a jump model, you can access the MOI backend, which very often is going to be a wrapper over the solver C API. Now, as one of the CPLEX developers told me at a workshop a few years ago, if a feature is not in the C API, it doesn't exist. Which means that because Julia exposes the C API, there's nothing in the C API that you cannot do in Julia. The only issue is such features may not be explicitly supported at the jump level. But if you know what you're doing, if you know how in the C API you would do it, then you can typically do it in Java. In particular, you can set anything that is solver specific from a parameter to a callback or specific variables or constraints attributes. So all of these, if you're willing to get a little bit hacky and dive into the guts of the solver, you can typically do it without having to leave the comfort of having a jump model that you've built in, in a nice way beforehand. And so typically you can build a, a problem with jump and then you can modify a few things. You can add your own callback, et cetera, et cetera. Now, a few features that we would like to add but are not exposed to in, in jump yet are things that are related to, for instance, optimality gaps or the ability to print a conflict, not just compute it. Uh, so these are minor things that uh, we, we use a lot. And so having those exposed in jump uh, would make our life a little bit easier, but it's nothing that we couldn't do. Some of the features that we're looking forward to be able to use, uh, and one in particular is the performance improvements on the nonlinear programming backend in, in jump and MOI. So we're very much looking forward to this and we're very excited to see this uh, happening. So let's talk a little bit about performance to finish with. Uh, there's most of the time, we're not really missing out of, on performance because again, the time it takes us to build the model is relatively small to the time it takes to solve the problem. And that means that the performance that might be left on the table in jump only becomes an issue whenever we see this overhead that, be, that becomes too large. So again, for us, when we deal with large problems, typically that's not too much of an issue. We have seen performance being left on the table in, in a few uh, circumstances. The first one is when the user does something bad. So for instance, you have a sparse matrix and you use a dense matrix to sort. Anything you do is gonna be terribly long. That has nothing to do with jump. Sometimes you do see that there's some performance that could be improved at the jump level. What I typically do to assess that is I ask myself, would just using the MOI layer be faster? And so I try to code the same thing that I did in jump in MOI, see if the result is drastically faster and then ask myself, uh, how much performance am I leaving on the table? And finally, you might leave performance on the table because of something the solver is doing. So for instance, we've seen that Ruby can be 10 times faster than Heist. Uh, so there's nothing we can do as a user. There's nothing we can do at the jump level. This would have to be fixed within the solver itself. So focusing on jump 
Some of the issues that we've seen are things that arise from type stability, which you can fix by annotating the types when, when for instance, you query, uh, you access objects that are registered in the model. So it's like a dictionary lookup, and this is typically not type stable. Uh, one thing that we've seen when using Gurubi was that just using the MY layer was about four times faster than using the jump layer, especially when building variables, when building constraints. So we're not exactly sure what is causing this performance difference. For instance, if we use highs, we didn't see such a big difference, although highs was 10 times slower than Gurubi. So there's probably some performance to begin here. Last uh, question that we asked ourselves was whether multi-threaded model binning would be useful, whether it would be tractable, and uh, whether that's something that we could include in Jump at some point. Probably not today, probably not tomorrow, but, but in a future release, uh, this is something that we think might eventually be useful. So let me conclude uh, this presentation. The Ramsey project is a big project with over 20 people in two different universities, very different backgrounds, very different expertise that span optimization, machine learning, and risk. The main case for using Jump in Ramsey was that it provided the best compromise between the set of features that it had, the expertise that the team had in using that tools, how easy it was to use Jump, including how convenient it was for us to get support and find resources, and then how fast the library was. It's now the default tool for all optimization code in, in the Ramsey project. We use it both to just build an optimization model and solve it, also to build optimization algorithms on top of Jump. So finally, some of the few challenges that we've encountered are not necessarily related to Jump, more I would say about maintaining a large code base with multiple people involved, maintaining high quality code, you know, having tests, having documentations, systematically doing bug reports, et cetera, et cetera. One of the other things that, that is a little bit more challenging to us is to systematically interface Julia and Python. So remember, we have to call Julia from Python and we also have to call Python from Julia. Uh, so these interfaces is where we also spend a little bit more effort making this work nicely, et cetera. We do think there's a little bit of room for improvement uh, in, in Jump. There are a few features that we would like to have. In terms of performance, we have not seen that to be a big issue for us. We do think that there's room for non-trivial improvements in performance. In particular, we've seen some large differences between Jump and MOI when using this in conjunction with Gurubi. Uh, I think in the, in the long term, one interesting direction would be to ask whether we can eventually support multi-threaded uh, building of a problem. Uh, because that could potentially improve building time for large models that um, present themselves to prioritization. So that concludes the talk. I'll be very happy to answer any question that uh, people may have during the conference. If you're watching this video uh, sometime after JuliaCon, you can also write me an email at, at my email address, matthew.tano at Thank you all and enjoy the rest of the conference.